Welcome to God's house. We're celebrating the 15th Sunday after Pentecost, and we're looking at how the Bible describes the church. Last week, we saw how the church endures, endures through turmoil, endures, endures through attacks. This week, we get to see how that turns out when we get to share Jesus' victory at the cross because the church militant will not be at war forever. There is a day that's coming when we will be the church triumphant. And so we get to see how God uses the church to prepare as many people as possible for the day of triumph. We begin our worship by singing a hymn of encouragement, Let Us Ever Walk with Jesus, hymn 452. Let us ever walk with Jesus, follow his example pure. Flee the world which would deceive us, and to sin our souls allure. Ever in his footsteps treading, body here yet soul above. Full of faith and hope and love, let us to the Father's bidding, faithful Lord, abide with me. Savior, lead, I follow thee. Let us suffer here with Jesus to his image ere conform. Heaven's glory soon will please us, sunshine follow on the storm. Though we sow in tears of sorrow, we shall reap in heavenly joy, and the fears that now annoy shall be laughter on the morrow. Christ, I suffer here with thee. There, O oh, share thy joy with me. Let us also die with Jesus, his death from the second death. From our soul's destruction frees us, quickens us with life's glad breath. Let us mortify while living, flesh and blood, and die to sin. And the grave that shuts us in shall but prove the gate to heaven. Jesus, here I die to thee, there to live eternally. Let us pray. O oh Lord Jesus, preserve the congregation of believers with your never-failing mercy. Help us avoid whatever is wicked and harmful and guide us in the way that leads to our salvation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. There are people who want things for you. There are also people who want things from you. Guess which one is more common? Through the Apostle Paul, God teaches us that the difference is whom someone is trying to help. When Paul wrote to the Galatians, there were people who were trying to avoid persecution by teaching people to follow the Old Testament law. They weren't really trying to help the Galatians. They were trying to help themselves. Not that the circumcision that they were teaching is bad. It isn't. It just doesn't matter spiritually anymore. It was an Old Testament sign. It pointed ahead to Jesus. Now those signs have been fulfilled and have become history. We can learn from them, but we don't have to follow them anymore. We want to follow Jesus instead. Today, there are still more people who want something from you than people who want something for you. Paul wanted the Galatians to have life and joy in Christ. And today, God's church wants everyone to have that too. One of the best things about church is that it is filled with people who care about you. God's people don't want to take anything from you. We want to work together to share God's peace and mercy. 
We read from the last chapter of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Galatians, inspired by God so we can hear and follow his voice. Those who want to look good in the flesh are the ones who are trying to compel you to be circumcised. Their only reason is so that they are not persecuted for the cross of Christ. As a matter of fact, those who are circumcised do not keep the law themselves. But they want to have you circumcised so that they can boast about your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. In fact, in Christ Jesus, circumcision or uncircumcision does not matter. What matters is being a new creation. Peace and mercy on those who follow this rule, namely, the Israel of God. This is the word of our God. Arguably, the worst thing Jesus ever called someone was Satan. Interestingly, he only called one person that, and it wasn't one of his enemies. And ironically, it was right after that same person had given a great confession of faith that Jesus was the Savior and the Son of the living God. It was Peter one of his three closest friends. It was someone who loved him and didn't want to see him suffer. Jesus had just started to teach his disciples about the plan of salvation. He was clear about what he would have to go through to make that happen. There was a price to be paid, and it was an enormously heavy one. He was also pretty clear about his rising from the dead. Peter must have missed that. Peter almost had to think that he was expressing his love for Jesus. He was probably pretty sure he was right in saying what he did. So what do you suppose he thought when Jesus called him Satan? Certainly get his attention. Peter's good intentions didn't matter when they contradicted God's word. They didn't matter when he was ignoring God's plan in favor of his own. It's a common and seriously underestimated mistake to reduce God's divine plans to earthly ones. People with very good intentions try to change the church into a good works organization that will provide goodwill and positive self-esteem. A place where the focus is on what we do and what we want instead of a place where we learn what God does and what God wants. Jesus is pretty clear who is behind that attempted change. Satan. Satan wants us to forget about sin and salvation and heaven. He wants to limit our thinking to the world we can see, not the God that we cannot. We pray that God will keep us focused on his plans and his works and his grace. Jesus' sacrifice freed us from slavery to temporary sinful things. His resurrection assures us that our life will be with him forever in heaven. We read from the Apostle Matthew's inspired first-hand account of Jesus' life, chapter 16. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and experts in the law, and be killed, and on the third day be raised again. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, May you receive mercy, Lord. This will never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a snare to me, because you are not thinking about the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In fact, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. After all, what will it benefit a person if he gains the whole world 
but forfeits his soul? Or what can a person give in exchange for his soul? This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The part of God's word we will consider together is taken from the book of the Judges, the 16th chapter. But the hair on his head began to grow after it had been shaved. Meanwhile, the Sarans of the Philistines gathered to make a great sacrifice to their god Dagon and to celebrate. They said, our God has given our enemy Samson into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God. Our God has given our enemy into our hands, the devastator of our land, who has caused the death of many of us. When they were feeling good, they said, send for Samson so that he can provide amusement for us. They summoned Samson from the prison and he served as their entertainment. They made Samson stand between the pillars. He said to the young man who led him by his hand, Put me where I can touch the pillars that support the building so that I can lean upon them. The building was full of men and women, as well as all the sarans of the Philistines. On the roof were about 3,000 more men and women watching Samson as he was amusing them. Samson called out to the Lord. He said, Lord God, remember me, I pray. Give me strength, I pray, this one more time. O oh God, let me get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes in one act of vengeance. Samson then grasped the two central pillars supporting the building. He leaned against them, one with his right hand and one with his left. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. He pushed with all his strength, and the building fell upon the Sarans and upon all the people who were inside. The Philistines he put to death when he died were more numerous than those he had put to death during his lifetime. Then his brothers and his father's entire household went down, carried him back, and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had served as judge of Israel for 20 years. This is the word of the Lord. Dear Christian friends, Samson was the rock star of judges. People know the, nascent, the name Samson. They know his strength. They know his fame. They know his bigger-than-life lifestyle. But not many people know his blindness. Samson, in fact, was blinded twice. The first time, he blinded himself. He was blinded by all the things that he wanted. God gave him this incredible strength and he used it to get what he wanted out of life instead of seeking God's will. Now, it doesn't mean he never did anything that God wanted him to do. But you had to question why. When he was with Delilah, you can see the blindness especially clearly. Delilah asked him, what would make you so weak that you would be humiliated? Why ask that question? So he spun some yarn, and you know what? The next morning, that's what happened to him. And of course, it didn't work, so she went at him again. And she said, how can you say you love me and you don't tell me the truth? Share with me how you can be weakened. And he told her something else. And the next morning, that happened. Three times that happened. So the fourth time, I don't wonder what he was thinking when he actually told her how he could be subdued. You have to wonder if he was really surprised the next morning. When that happened too. Then when he was taken, imprisoned, blinded again, and humiliated. Ironically, that's when he first started to be able to see. And that's where we pick up the story here in Judges 16.
In verse 22, it says, But the hair on his head began to grow after it had been shaved. So you consider what Samson had just gone through. He had just lost. He had been imprisoned. He had been blinded. He had been thrown into prison. And it was the best place he ever was. Because while we look at Samson and we see him grinding in a mill, we see his, his eyes are gone because they blinded him, but we also see what God is doing. He didn't have magic hair, but that hair was a sign of his dedication to God. And while he was grinding in that prison, God was restoring his soul. God was restoring his faith and God was restoring his strength. That's where he needed to be to be able to see who he was. Because he got lost. He thought he was the powerful man. He thought he was the man in charge. He thought he was the one who could do whatever he wanted. And he forgot that he was God's servant. So we see God at work here. As he still is bringing people to repentance, helping us to see who we are, whether it's through difficult times like Samson's, whether it's through teaching and the word of God, whether it's through a friend, a Christian friend who encourages us to remember God and his grace and his will in our lives. God still restores that's why jesus came he didn't come to destroy the world he came to save it he came to rescue people and to restore them to the image of god and then in verse 23 it says meanwhile the sarans of the philistines gathered to make a great sacrifice to their god dagon and to celebrate they said our god has given our enemy samson into our hands and there's another huge misconception the first one would be that samson was in a bad place when in fact he was in god's hands the other one would be thinking that the philistines were in a good place you know they're celebrating their victory over their great enemy but they're both trusting the wrong things and they're fearing the wrong things First, they're trusting the wrong thing because they think their god, Dagon, had given their enemy, Samson, into their hands. When we recognize they didn't defeat Samson, God removed Samson's strength. It wasn't the Philistines who put Samson into that prison. It was God. God's power is what gave Samson his strength. God's judgment is what removed it. So the Philistines were trusting the wrong things, and there's nothing more common than that. Totally ignoring God's role in this and assigning it to something else. In fact, assigning it to their very own God. And we still do it. Instead of recognizing that God is taking care of us, how often do people put their trust in money put their trust in talent put their trust in government put their trust in human temporary flawed sinful things and forget that everything good comes from god their trust is in the wrong place so their fear was in the wrong place too the one they were afraid of was Samson. The one they should be afraid of is God. And there are still things that cause us to be afraid. And maybe we're fearing the wrong things. Maybe we're afraid of a virus. Maybe we're afraid of the wrong political party getting into, into power. Maybe we're afraid of riots and violence. Maybe we're afraid of all the things that this sinful world can throw at us because we forget that God is in control. Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body but can't kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can throw both soul and body 
into hell. So the Philistines didn't get it. They didn't see what was really going on. When the people saw him, they praised their God. Our God has given our enemy into our hands, the devastator of our land. As though Samson was their judge. God is the judge. And he's the one we need to see. So in verse 25, it says, When they were feeling good, they said, Send for Samson so that he can provide amusement for us. And here, they're not only underestimating God, they're underestimating his servants. They thought it was safe to have a servant of God whom God had appointed as judge to come into their party because they thought they had defeated him. They thought it was their strength and their cleverness and their resources. They thought they were in control. When in fact we recognize that was all God's choice. All God's doing. God allowed Satan, or God allowed Samson to be captured. God removed his strength because Samson needed to learn something. And now they're bringing God's servant into the middle of their party. God's servant who carries God's power. God's servant who had been appointed to judge them. Of course, we can see the upside of that. I think very often we underestimate the power that goes with us. Wherever we go, whether we're visiting family, whether we're praying, whether we're in church, the power of God goes with us. In our neighborhoods, we carry the power, the grace, the forgiveness, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. People underestimate the power that's in God's word. We underestimate the power that's in us. The way the Philistines underestimated the power that went wherever Samson went because God went there too. And then in verse 27, the building was full of men and women as well as the sarins of all the Philistines and on the roof were about 3,000 more. And here we see Samson Submitting to God. Recognizing who he was. That he was God's servant. Sent to do God's work. And he cried out, Remember me. Doesn't that remind you of the thief on the cross next to Jesus? Another broken sinner who recognized that he needed the grace of God. And so Samson said, remember me. Please give me the strength to serve you one more time. Give me strength, I pray, this one more time, O God. Let me get revenge on the Philistines. Let me serve as the judge you appointed me to be. Not seeking my own will. Not seeking what I can get for myself, whether it's fame or power or all, any of those things. Let me do your work. Even if it costs me my life. And in verse 29, Samson grasped the two central pillars supporting the building. He leaned on them, one on his right, one on his left, and he said, let me die with the Philistines. And he brought the house down. Here we see why Samson was who he was. For Samson, he was a judge delivering God's justice on a people whose time had come. So why are we here? We see this beautiful picture of Samson committing his entire life, recognizing that the very breath that he breathed belonged to God. The time that he had belonged to God. And if he could dedicate that to God, if he could do God's work, whether by his life or by his death, that was worth it. So why are we here? God hasn't appointed us as anybody's judge. He's appointed us as his ambassadors. And 
while we do bring the message of God's judgment, we also bring the message of God's gospel, of God's grace. We are the ambassadors who get to bring the message that Jesus was teaching his disciples, that the Son of God himself allowed himself to be arrested and abused and humiliated and killed so that we can go free. That's who we are. But like Samson, so many times we get distracted by the things we're chasing and we forget about the things God wants us to do. Samson gave his life for God's service. And if you jump back to Hebrews chapter 11 and you look at those people who are in God's hall of fame of faith, guess whose name appears? Samson. The way God saw Samson was not all the mistakes that he made, was not the blindness that he had, was not the women that he chased, was not the, the humiliation that he endured. It was the faith that he gave him. The faith that allowed him to go home. And that's who we are. We are not defined by our sins. We are not defined by our weaknesses. We're defined by our Savior who took all of our sins away, who's made us into His children, who's filled us with His power so that we recognize that this isn't where we will be forever. Here is where we fight the good fight. Here is where we recognize that Satan is trying to drag souls into hell and that God is using us and the word and the sacraments he's put into our hands to rescue people so that we can join together as the church triumphant. And in that last verse, verse 31, his brothers and his father's entire household went down, carried him back, buried him, and he had served as judge of Israel for 20 years. But he lived forever because his life was not limited to this earth. His life continues at God's right hand, in God's presence, before God's throne, with his Savior, living forever in peace and in joy and in the forgiveness that is ours too. So after spending his life chasing things for himself, the fame, the clothes, the women, the control, the revenge. At the end, he gave his life for God and he died in faith. So once again, he was a man of faith. He had in mind the things of God rather than the things of men. He realized his treasure was in heaven and he gave his life in the service of his God. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, our great physician, we come before you in great need. We ask that you would end this plague on our world. We ask that you would cause the violence to cease. We do not ask because we are worthy, but because you are gracious and merciful. If it is your will, heal those who are afflicted, comfort those who are suffering, protect those who are attacked, grant wisdom and success to those who are treating and researching this disease, protect those who are opposing violence and fighting the fires. Teach us to celebrate your blessings and your love. Help us not to take for granted our health or the connections we have among family and friends. In your name we come to you. Amen. Lord, we ask that you would take special care of your children, the Beaumont family, and Milford Benke, and Ashley Bordelis, Artis Cerny, and Gladys Constein, and Jerry Garbrecht, Dorothy Johnson, Rose Carr, Noah and Kristen Olson, Lisa Schmidt, Aaron Wood, Jesse Zack. We ask that you would protect Jesse Adams, and Greg Caro, and Aaron Forsberg, Nathan Godfrey, and Joshua Jansen, and Jesse Johnston, Patrick Knoppenberg, Aaron Stocker, 
Dylan Vanko, Thomas Weirich, Steve Campbell, Greg Hemker, Raymond Cashaw, and David Peterson. Lord Jesus, in your name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. And we conclude our worship by singing Fight the Good Fight, hymn number 457. Fight the good fight with all your might. Christ is your strength and Christ your light. Lay hold on life and it shall be your joy and crown eternally. Run the straight race through God's good grace. Lift up your eyes and seek his face. Life with its way before us lies. Christ is the path and Christ the prize. Faint not nor fear, his arms are near. He changes not and you only believe and you will see that Christ is Lord eternally. We have just two announcements. The first one, a reminder that we want to memorize as much of God's word as we can. So today we're recommending that you memorize this verse from the gospel lesson. But Jesus turned, to Peter, Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a snare to me because you are not thinking the things of God, but the things of men. It's a warning for Peter and a warning for us to remember that we seek God's will, not our own. And in God's will, we find freedom and life. We also want to uh, give you some exciting news about Sunday school. Uh, with the COVID restrictions and the uncertainty that's going on, we're offering online Sunday school. Beginning Sunday, September 27th, lessons are going to be taught by an experienced Wells teacher via YouTube, and there's going to be engaging and age-appropriate le lesson videos tied to the printed student lessons that our church will provide to you at no cost. This new approach pre presents an easy yet meaningful way for you to encourage your child's faith in Christ. So you can pick up the materials at church or have them mailed directly to your home. Just contact the church office to be part of this exciting new ministry. And we pray that God will bless you as we fight the good fight in the church militant and look forward to the day when God brings us home to the church triumphant.